I'm a 20 year old male and this happened to me in the winter of 2018, the day after Christmas. Me and my parents were on vacation in Maine, visiting my grandmother. As you can probably imagine, being in the state of Maine during the winter, it was freezing. We came up from Texas, so this was definitely not my climate if you know what I mean. My parents had gone out to visit a friend who lived in the area, while me and my grandmother stayed back and watched some movies. My grandmother turned in at about 8 o'clock, and I eventually got bored of watching TV, so I decided to put on my coat and go for a walk outside. My grandmother's neighborhood has this neat stone maze, complete with angel statues and fountains. It was really cool, and something you really don't see a whole lot in neighborhoods these days. My grandmother's neighborhood was one of those 50 plus communities. I doubt you could have something like this in a neighborhood full of kids without it getting defaced with spray painted pictures of penises or something. For me, I actually admired works of architecture like this and was impressed by the amount of effort it must have taken to construct it. It was open from dusk till dawn, however, my grandmother told me that there was no neighborhood security during the holidays and no one would say anything if I wanted to go through the maze after hours, so I did just that. I brought a flashlight with me of course, and it took me about 5 minutes to reach the entrance of the maze from my grandmother's place. The maze wasn't massive, but it was big enough that you could get turned around, at least for a little bit. If I could give you guys a somewhat accurate visual of this maze, think of the maze in Resident Evil 4, where Leon had to fight off those dogs and gather puzzle pieces. That's roughly the same size as this maze. When I walked through this maze during the daytime, I would usually listen to my headphones, but something told me not to put them on that night, and it's a good thing that I followed my instincts. After I'd say it was about 10 minutes, I suddenly heard the sound of metal scraping against the stone walls. As soon as I heard the sound, alarm bells went off in my head. I froze in place and carefully listened for any other sounds. The scraping noise came again, except this time there was a deep voice that followed it. Abandon hope all ye who enter here. This sent chills down my spine, realizing that I was now in a maze at night with a possible maniac. The maze had these areas where a statue or a fountain would be. In these locations, there was shrubbery that lined the maze walls. There was just enough space between the wall and the bushes for a small person like me to hide behind. And since I didn't know the best route to exit the maze from where I was, I decided that the best course of action was to hide. I made my way into the area where a statue of David the Archangel was, and I quickly took cover behind the shrubbery that lined the walls. The streetlights located outside of the maze provided enough light for you to see your surroundings. However, it was still dark enough to obscure the details of objects and people. I feel that I needed to point that out, because from my hiding spot, I could see the corridor that I entered from. After about a minute, I watched a dark figure emerge from the shadows and make its way in front of the statue. I remember thinking how awesome it would be if the statue came to life and helped me out of this situation. But that thought quickly faded when the figure made its way directly in front of me. I could now see that it was holding something in its hands. I know that I said that you really couldn't tell any distinguishing features of objects because of the poor lighting. However, it was obvious what the figure was holding, even in the dark. I could make out the distinct shape of a pickaxe. As the figure moved slowly through the area, I heard what I can only describe as teeth clattering. This only disturbed me even more as the dark shadow moved to the other side of the area and disappeared into the opposite corridor. After a few minutes of gathering my wits, I was reasonably sure that if I went back down the way I came, I could backtrack and make my escape. I cautiously moved out from my hiding spot to the corridor. I stopped in my tracks as I heard the sound of metal scraping again. It was coming from the opposite corridor where the figure had vanished. Before I could turn to look, I heard that same deep voice cut through the silence. 
I see you. I turned my head to see the figure running towards me, pickaxe raised above its head. That's when I took off through the corridor and frantically made my way through the dark maze. There was no time to navigate through the maze properly, so I just had to guess my way through the labyrinth as the lunatic with the pickaxe closed in behind me. After about five minutes of twists and turns, I finally saw the exit. I tore through the snow-covered ground and towards the opening. Just before I crossed the threshold, I heard a loud smash coming from right behind me. I gave a quick glance to see the pickaxe lying in the snow by the entrance. What I think happened was that my pursuer saw that I was about to exit the maze and decided to heave his pickaxe at me, but missed. As soon as I was outside of my grandmother's house, I pulled out my phone and called the police. But like with most stories like this, they arrived too late. Having experienced this myself, I can tell you that this outcome does make sense. My assailant failed to capture or kill me, so I don't think that they would stick around for the police to show up. The officers took my statement and did a thorough search of the area. They also had a squad car patrolling through the neighborhood for the rest of that night. I didn't tell my parents or my grandmother what happened until the next day. I figured that there was no need to worry them that night. I consider myself to be a pretty level-headed person, and that's mainly why I chose to share my story. Situations like this are terrifying, but you have to try to keep your wits about you. If I had lost my composure in that maze, I'm pretty sure that pickaxe would have found its way into my skull. I'm a female in her 30s. I was born and raised in Gainesville, Florida. About a decade ago, while I was still in college, I would often take babysitting jobs to make extra money. I usually would watch Mrs. Gruder's two young boys named Ashton and Samuel. They were twins and were very well behaved. It was always a pleasure spending the night with them. This was around late October on a Friday. Right after my class let out, I went straight over to Mrs. Gruder's place. She and her husband planned on going out of town for a few days, and I was to watch over the twins until their aunt came over on the following day. This worked out well for me, because the boys and I would usually watch TV in the living room until around 8.30, which was when I was to put them to bed. I planned on spending the rest of the night studying for the upcoming mid-semester exam. After I put the boys to bed, I was working on my laptop in the living room, when suddenly... That eerie feeling of being watched came over me. I tried to shake off this feeling, but I became increasingly uncomfortable. It got so bad that I had to get up and look out the back patio door. When I looked out, the only thing I saw was an empty backyard. But something did catch my eye. Towards the fence that separated their yard from the neighbors was one of those old metal swing sets. I remember Mrs. Gruder mentioning at some point that it was left over from the previous owners of the house. There were only two swings on the set, and one of them was rocking back and forth, the way it would if someone had just gotten up from it. When I turned back around, I was nearly startled to death to see that Sam was standing directly behind me. My heart nearly jumped out of my chest. After stopping myself from going into cardiac arrest, I asked Sammy what he was doing out of bed. His response made my blood turn to ice. The woman with no head is keeping me up. Can you please tell her to leave? I was floored to hear him say that, especially after experiencing that uneasy feeling while I was studying. But my rationality took a hold of me, and I told him that he just had a bad dream. But he asked me to come with him back to his room and stay with him until he fell asleep again. Of course I obliged him. I adored Sammy, and I would have done anything for him or his brother. When we got back into his bedroom, I was surprised to see that Ash was sitting up in bed. As soon as he saw us, he asked his brother, Did you tell her about the woman that was in here? Sam responded, Yes, but she thinks I was having a bad dream. I didn't know that you saw her too. I was immediately put on edge. If Sammy was just having a nightmare... Why did Ashton see the same thing? 
I tried my best to convince the boys that because they were twins, they shared a special connection. And when one of them would have a bad dream, the other could sometimes feel it too. I didn't believe my own words, but I didn't want to bring up the word ghost because I didn't know how their mother would react to me explaining to them what a ghost was. I decided to stay with the boys and read them a bedtime story until they fell back asleep. Once they were both snoring again, I made my way back into the living room. I immediately noticed that I never closed the blinds above the patio door. As I approached the door, a stranger stepped into view. It was a woman wearing an old-fashioned dress. She appeared to have no color to her. She looked like she came right off the screen of one of those old-timey black-and-white movies. She did not look like someone who was living in the 21st century. The woman stared daggers at me. I could feel the hatred behind her cold eyes. What happened next is something that I still try to convince myself didn't happen, but my memory is just too vivid for me to be making this up. The woman's head did a 360 and then simply fell off her body. I remember putting one hand over my mouth to stop myself from screaming. The headless apparition remained standing, even after its head fell off. I know that what I'm about to say will make no sense to anyone listening, but I could still feel the woman's cold stare, even though her head was now gone. The image of the headless woman faded from view, and I quickly closed the blinds and made my way back into the boy's bedroom. I slipped under the covers with Sammy and stared at the bedroom door until I eventually passed out. I told no one about what I saw. It wasn't until I got into my car after the boy's aunt came to relieve me that I had a complete nervous breakdown. I never told the Gruders what I experienced because I didn't want to risk them switching babysitters. I cared too much about Ash and Sammy to allow something like this to prevent me from ever seeing them again. I continued to babysit for the Gruders until the twins were old enough to look after themselves. The Gruder house was located in a pretty unremarkable neighborhood. It was about as normal as you could get. Paranormal activity was the last thing I ever expected to experience there. Gainesville has quite the history, so I'm pretty sure there are more than a few restless spirits wandering about. And although I never went through anything like that again, I would still sometimes see one of those old swings rocking back and forth in the dark. I'm not much of a storyteller, so bear with me. During the 90s, I went through a very rough time in my life. After a failed marriage, I became a bit of a nomad, wandering across country on foot with no particular destination. It was a stupid idea, but I was in a very hopeless place back then, and just looking to experience something new. I had been traveling down South Dakota and hitched a ride with a truck driver into Nebraska, for those of you who have never been to that state, there are large sections of land that go on for miles with nothing but cornfields lining either side of the road. We split ways at a rest stop, and I made my way into what I now know to be the Sand Hills of Nebraska. The Sand Hills region is one of the most isolated areas in the United States, 20,000 square miles of nothing but dunes and prairies. I planned on hitchhiking my way to the nearest town, and catching a bus to visit a friend I had in Omaha. Full disclosure, I had absolutely no idea what the hell I was doing. I subscribed to the I'll figure it out when I get there mentality. At the time, I didn't know a whole lot about Nebraska, but I found out the hard way that this stretch of road was not ideal for hitchhiking. I barely saw any cars going down this road, and the ones that did completely ignored me. Twelve hours had passed and I was running low on food and water. I was utterly exhausted at this point, and I needed to find a place to rest for a while. I had about an hour left of daylight. Lucky for me, I happened to come upon an old farmhouse that was situated about a half mile away from the main road. From a distance, I thought this place may have been occupied, but when I got closer, it was clear to me that this house was abandoned. This was around the fall, so weather in Nebraska wasn't terrible, however the nights were a bit on the cold side, so I decided to hold up in this house for the night 
and continue my journey the next day. I had enough supplies to last me one more night. The house was your typical rotting husk. Smelled like mold, severe water damage, creaking floors, etc. The living room seemed to be the only decent place to settle down at, so I unpacked my sleeping bag and eventually dozed off. I woke up to the sound of floorboards creaking. I immediately sat up and listened. I could hear several pairs of footsteps thudding all around the house. They were coming from upstairs, downstairs, on the back porch outside, and even in the same room with me. But I didn't see a thing. I quickly got to my feet and walked over to the nearest window and peered out. What I saw was truly alarming and sent a wave of nausea through my entire body. Several cloaked figures were standing side by side. They appeared to be encircling the house. Because of the footsteps I heard, I thought there may have been people in the house with me. So in an effort to defuse things, I made another big brain decision and spoke up. Um, hello? I'm sorry if I'm trespassing. I was just looking for a place to rest for the night. I thought this place was abandoned. Again, I'm sorry. All the footsteps stopped at once. An eerie silence followed. It was so quiet that I could have heard a mouse shitting in the corner. I got this real bad feeling in my gut, so I reached into my backpack and pulled out my hunting knife. I gathered the rest of my things and slowly moved out into the hallway. Aside from the mysterious figures outside, I was also thinking of what was making those footsteps inside the house. As I said, I heard several footsteps when I woke up, so I figured it wouldn't be long before I ran into someone inside the house. But after combing the entire downstairs, I didn't see or hear anything. I could tell something was very off. That bad feeling I mentioned earlier intensified, despite the fact that I knew there was a bunch of weirdos and cloaks waiting for me outside. Something told me that if I didn't leave the house that very moment, something terrible was going to happen to me. The house was located in a wide open clearing. Beyond the clearing was a barrier of tall grass. When I left through the front door, I stopped directly in front of the house. No matter which direction I looked, I saw another hooded menace blocking my way. I suddenly felt this heat on my back. I quickly turned around and was shocked to see that the house I just left was now engulfed in flames. I cannot explain how this happened. Moments before, I was inside that house, walking around, and it was now on fire. I backed away. I decided that I was going to run through the figures and get the hell out of Dodge, but when I turned back around, the figures were nowhere in sight. Things were getting way too bizarre for me at that point. The only thing I knew for sure was that I had to get the fuck out of that place. When I got back out to the main road, I didn't stop walking until I finally got to a town, whose name I can't remember. The rest of my time in Nebraska went well, and I got my life together shortly after I got back home from my trip. As long as I live, I'll never forget that old farmhouse and those mysterious cloaked figures. This incident still baffles me to this day, but perhaps some things are best left unanswered. I'm in my late 60s, and I grew up in the Bronx. The Bronx isn't exactly known for supernatural activity, but I can tell you from living there for many years, a lot of strange things happen in New York, aside from the drug abuse and the crime that takes place in the back alleys. Let's go back in time to 1962. It was my seventh birthday. My grandmother got me this vintage Mattel Jack in the Box. This was back when these kinds of toys were more commonplace. From the moment I opened the gift, I immediately got a bad feeling. Jack in the Boxes are naturally creepy to some people, and I was never a fan of them, even as a kid. But I loved it when my grandmother came up from Brooklyn to visit us, and if I even hinted that I didn't like the toy she got me, 
my mother would have made sure I didn't sit down for a week. I don't know where my grandmother got this thing, but if I had to guess, she probably got it from one of the several pawn shops in the area. I think this is significant to point out, because this means that the toy was not bought brand new and had a previous owner. After my birthday celebration was over, me and my dad put all of my presents in my room. I specifically remember setting the jack-in-the-box down in my toy chest. My family had this tradition where we would always gather in the living room and listen to some radio shows before going to bed. When 8 o'clock rolled around, I was told to brush my teeth and go to bed. When I was done in the washroom and went into my bedroom to turn in, I instantly noticed that the jack-in-the-box was now resting at the foot of my bed. I was confused because I remembered putting it away in my toy chest, but I figured that one of my parents might have been messing with me, so I placed the toy under my bed and tucked myself in. I ended up having these violent, horrifying nightmares over the next following weeks. I remembered seeing unspeakable things in my dreams. Everything is obscured to me now from the passing of time and my mind trying to block out certain things but I'm confident that what I saw in my dreams was of a sexual nature. I would wake up screaming many times to the point where my mother ended up taking me to the doctors to find out what was wrong. The doctors performed several tests on me and concluded that I was perfectly healthy and recommended that I be taken to a child psychologist. The night that I got back from the doctors was when this whole situation would reach its climax and conclusion. Maybe it's obvious to everyone listening to this what was going on, but at the time, I didn't really have a clue. I woke up that night, not from a nightmare, but from that feeling you get when someone is watching you. I had a nightlight plugged in next to my bed. In the dim light, I saw the jack-in-the-box my grandmother had gotten for me resting at the foot of my bed. That's when the unthinkable happened. It was like a scene straight out of a horror film. The crank on the side of the box slowly began to turn, and a distorted, slowed down version of the melody began to play. When the tune finished, the clown inside the box popped out. Even though I saw it coming, it still made me jump. However, there was something else that I noticed that instantly made me forget all about the creepy little plastic clown. Recalling this now still makes my insides crawl. Looming just behind the toy box was a tall black figure. The only thing I could tell you about this shadowy presence is that it had these long horns on top of its head. I was raised Catholic, but I was never told at that point in my life about the fallen angel Lucifer or his foot soldiers, commonly referred to as demons. My fragile little mind could not comprehend what I was witnessing, but I remembered my teachings about God's love and the power of prayer. So I closed my eyes and began to pray aloud. Shortly after I began my prayer, I heard a loud shrieking as if I was inflicting pain to whatever was in my room. As soon as I opened my eyes, I saw that the figure was gone, and the box that was still resting at the foot of my bed was now closed. We lived on the third floor of an apartment building. Outside of my room was one of those stereotypical dark alleys New York City is known for. I opened up my bedroom window and hurled the box out. As soon as I threw it, I was expecting to hear it crash on the concrete below, but instead... I heard what can only be described as giant wings flapping. I didn't see anything, but I felt a gust of cold air hit me, and I quickly shut my window and ran back under the covers. I'm sharing my story to inform everyone that there are dark forces out there beyond our comprehension. You'll be surprised to hear that I'm no longer a part of any organized religion. I'm still a very spiritual person, and I do believe in a higher power. If you're confused by this, I'll try to break this down for you in the simplest of terms. Dark entities, like the one I encountered so many years ago, are comprised of energy, 
and they react to other energies in different ways. If you show fear in the face of adversary, they will feed off that fear and become stronger. If you show bravery and perform an act like prayer as a means to combat the presence, that is what ultimately drives them out. I believe wholeheartedly that you don't have to belong to a church or a certain religion to deal with an intruding presence. It was this event that inspired me to become both a counselor and a paranormal investigator. I have used my experiences with the paranormal to help many families across America. So if you ever encounter one of these dark spirits in your home, remember my words. Do not show fear. Be brave. And make it clear that they are not welcomed. I'm originally from Mexico. For reasons that will become very obvious, I wish to remain anonymous. I used to be involved in the Mexican cartel. I mainly transported drugs across the border into the United States. To make a long story short, I was caught and cooperated with the feds in exchange for immunity and asylum. Before I go any further, you can go ahead and label me a snitch if you want to. I don't care. I personally feel pretty good about routing out a bunch of drug-dealing murderers that work for an organization that is responsible for destroying so many of my fellow Mexicans' lives. I was forced into this life at a young age. I've always hated the cartel, and was already plotting a way to flee Mexico with my mother and two younger sisters. You could say that it was a good thing that I ended up getting caught. The story is not about how I got out of the cartel. It's about the closest call I ever had during my time with the cartel. This happened during the early days. It was the summer of 2005. I remember the date specifically because I had just turned 18 a day prior. Even though I was barely an adult, I was a very intimidating looking guy. I come from a long line of very physically strong men. I've been lifting weights since I was a child. I'm an even-tempered guy and I don't consider myself to be an aggressive person, but I will put somebody through the wall if they piss me off. It was because of my physical presence and my piece of shit father, who was also in the cartel, made me a target for recruitment. When I first started out, myself and two other guys would drive around Mexico City and collect debts and packages from people who owed money to the cartel or one of our distributors. It was on the fourth or fifth run that we ran into some trouble. There was this particular club we frequented where a lot of business was conducted. To make things simple, an exchange would go down in a back room, and we would come shortly after and collect the revenue and drop it off to our capo. So that night, we entered the club and began making our way to the back room. It was a fairly busy night for the club. This DJ from out of town was performing there, so people from all over were there to see him. To get to the back room, we had to go through the main dance floor to the opposite side of the building. There were some renovations that prevented us from using the back entrance. We got out onto the dance floor and started making our way through the crowd. When we were about halfway there, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. It was the barrel of a shotgun being pointed directly at me. I quickly ducked, and not a second later, I heard the gun go off. Unfortunately, an innocent girl who was standing beside me caught the bullet. She was shot at point-blank range, and I don't mean to be insensitive when I say this, but the poor girl's head was blasted apart. I remember several things happening simultaneously after the shotgun went off. All of the partygoers immediately fled the club. From my position on the ground, all I saw was a wave of moving legs. When I stood up, I saw a deserted club, my two co-workers with their guns drawn, cursing up a storm, and, unfortunately, the corpse of the young girl who was just shot. I assumed that the shooter got away in the chaos. We quickly busted into the back office to find another bullet-ridding corpse. It was a club owner, who was our contact. We immediately fled the scene before the police showed up. I was never informed as to what happened with the club owner and who almost took my head off with a shotgun. I was on the lowest rank of the cartel and they kept us in the dark about a lot of things. I'm grateful that I'm no longer a part of that life. 
I would like to end things by saying a big fuck you to that asshole who tried to kill me and ended up shooting an innocent girl that night. And to all of those cartel members who got locked up because of me, you got what you deserved. And I'll see you in hell. I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin. It was Halloween of 2013. I was 16 at the time. Me, my sister Lauren, who was 14, and my brother Jacob, who was 11, were on our own that night. Our mom was taking care of our sick grandmother, and dad was out of town on business. Trick-or-treating in our neighborhood always ended at around 9 o'clock. Our parents never made us go to school the day after Halloween, so we would usually stay up past our bedtime and watch movies. However, since we were by ourselves and amped up on all the sugar we had consumed, we made other plans. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Wisconsin, but there are a lot of farms here. Our town was pretty much surrounded on all sides by them. In fact, there was a farm just outside our neighborhood, a short walking distance from our house. Every fall, this farm would have an annual pumpkin patch, and we thought it would be fun to go check it out. We didn't plan on vandalizing anything. We just wanted to stroll around and see how creepy the place was in the dark. The pumpkin patch was situated between two large cornfields. About a mile or so behind the patch was the house that the farmer lived in. For the sake of the story, we will call him Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller had always given me the creeps. There was something about him that I could never put my finger on. The only way I can describe it is that he didn't seem to be a real person, if that makes sense. It was like at any moment, his skin would fall off and reveal him to be some kind of alien or something. I know that sounds like a strange thing to say, but I'm telling you, there was something off about Mr. Miller. The three of us arrived at the dark, deserted pumpkin patch at around 10 o'clock. There was a series of large sheds between Mr. Miller's house and the patch, so we weren't too worried about being seen. I remember that there was always a couple of scarecrows off in the distance, in the adjacent cornfields. The first thing I noticed when we got there was that there was a third scarecrow that was mounted in the middle of the pumpkin patch. I've been to this patch several times before. Our parents even took us here two weeks prior to pick up pumpkins to make into jack-o'-lanterns, and I never remember seeing a scarecrow here before. It usually wouldn't be any cause for alarm. It was Halloween after all, right? However, upon seeing the scarecrow, I instantly had a sinking feeling in my stomach. I looked to either side of me and saw the two usual scarecrows standing in the fields. I figured maybe Mr. Miller wanted to be extra spooky this year. We wandered aimlessly around the pumpkin patch for about 10 minutes. Every so often, I would look to the scarecrow and I could swear its head would be positioned differently every time I would look at it. It seemed to be watching the three of us as we made our way through the pumpkin patch. I brushed it off as some kind of optical illusion, coupled with the fact that I was in some weirdo's creepy pumpkin patch in the dead of Halloween night. When we approached the scarecrow, Lauren instantly became uneasy. She was seriously creeped out by the figure. I pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight to get a better look at it. Even from a distance, you could tell that the other scarecrows out in the fields were nothing but straw stuffed into some old clothes. But this one was different. A lot of effort went into its design. It was mounted on a pole in the typical scarecrow stance. It was wearing a dirty pair of overalls with a red patterned flannel shirt underneath. Its head was a burlap sack with a jack-o'-lantern face stitched onto it, and it was wearing a black conical hat with a pair of matching black boots. As my phone's dim light passed over its surface, I noticed these dark red stains on the overalls. As I was examining the straw man, Jacob, being the little shit he was, came between me and Lauren. I bet you're too chicken to take off its mask. Me, never passing up a chance to show up my little brother, accepted the dare, 
on the condition that he would have to forfeit all of the Reese's cups that he had gathered that night. After Jacob agreed to those terms, I had Lauren hold my phone's light on the scarecrow while I made my way towards it. As I got closer, the sinking feeling I mentioned earlier became stronger. However, my desire for those delicious peanut butter cups and the satisfaction I would get eating them in front of Jacob overpowered my fear. Now only inches away from it, I slowly reached for the burlap sack. That's when the unthinkable happened. One of the scarecrow's arms shot forth and a gloved hand grabbed my wrist. The first thing I heard was Lauren screaming as the flashlight vanished. The next thing I heard was my two siblings taking off on foot, leaving me for dead. I tried pulling away, but the scarecrow's grip was too tight. I yanked and yanked, but it was no use. I then looked up in absolute horror to see that the scarecrow was now leaning forward on its pole and was now looking at me dead in the eye. I was like a deer in the headlights. I stopped struggling and just stared back at the stitched on grinning face. A muffled voice then came from beneath the burlap sack and what was said really caught me off guard. Happy Halloween. And with that, the scarecrow let go. I never ran so fast before in my life. I hauled ass out of there and back towards my neighborhood. I met Lauren and Jacob outside the entrance to our neighborhood. They were relieved to see that I was still alive. I'm glad I got to them before one of them called our mother, because we all would have been in some deep shit if she found out that we went to the pumpkin patch after dark. After giving them both a harsh scolding for ditching me, we walked home. Even now, it still baffles me to no end that someone would be out there in a dark, deserted pumpkin patch long after it closed, dressed up as a scarecrow, just waiting for someone to come along. I don't know if it was Mr. Miller or one of his farmhands, but when my parents offered to take us there the following year, all three of us promptly turned them down. I may have gotten the daylight scared out of me that night. However, I did enjoy eating all of Jacob's Reese's cups the following day. I live in Central Florida. My neighborhood is one of those unassuming, quiet suburban havens. Not much happens around here these days. It's important to make that distinction because once upon a time, my neighborhood was terrorized by a serial rapist back in the late 80s. This was before my time, but apparently he used to hide in the bushes along a bike path that runs behind the neighborhood and would attack unexpecting females. It was this series of attacks that led to a strict closing time of 9 o'clock. However, this did not stop the neighborhood kids from venturing the trail after hours, including myself. I'd say this happened around the summer of 2007. Me and a friend of mine, who I'll call Jake, were being a couple of teenage losers and smashing beer bottles against the trees along the trail. I would say that this happened around 10.30 p.m. To give you a general layout of this trail, it was two miles long and started at a lake that was located at the far side of the neighborhood. It ran behind the rows of houses and ended at a soccer field that was just outside the neighborhood. The area of the trail right before you get to the field was the narrowest part, with trees suffocating it on either side. Despite any moonlight that may be out at night, rest assured that this particular area would always be pitch black. Jake and I were approaching this part of the path. We planned on messing around the soccer field on the other side. As we got closer to the opening, I started to get a feeling that we were being watched. I motioned for Jake to stop as I listened carefully. Is anyone there? I said on a whim. To our surprise, a figure emerged from the darkness of the trees in front of us. Since the trail was closed at the time, the only lights we had were the street lights out on the main road, which wasn't much, but we could still make out that the figure before us was wearing a dark hoodie with one of those creepy frowning theater masks. The instant I saw the stranger, I felt a cold chill run through my entire body. I'm sure Jake felt it too. 
We slowly backed away. Jake turned around as I kept my eyes on the frowning man. And the next thing I heard was Jake whispering, Oh shit. I turned to see what had startled Jake. And there was another hooded figure standing right behind us. It was also wearing a theater mask, except this one was smiling. Jake and I stood back to back as we watched the figures on either side of us begin to walk towards us slowly. I had my eye on the frowning man as Jake watched the other one. I felt another chill crawl up my back as the figure moved closer, revealing a large kitchen knife in its hands. This guy has a knife, I heard Jake say from behind me. We had to think fast. They were coming at us from both directions. That's when I had an idea. Right before you got to the narrow path, the trail was bordered by residential fences. These fences are fairly tall, but not impossible to scale. Jake, we have to try to jump the fence and get back out to the main road, or we're dead. I said under my breath. I tried to be as quiet as possible, but the moment those words left my mouth, the frowning man began sprinting towards us. Fuck! Go now! Cried Jake. I assumed that the smiling man was doing the same. We bolted towards the fence. I was the first to reach it. I got into a crouching stance and balled my hands together to launch Jake over. Once Jake was on the other side, I jumped up and started to pull myself up. I then felt a hand grab my ankle and was quickly brought to the ground. I look up and see the frowning man towering over me with his knife raised up. I tried to scream, but my voice was caught in my throat. All I could do was watch as my life ended. Suddenly, the frowning man staggered back as he was struck in the head by a large object. Kevin, run! There's an opening in the side! I looked behind me to see Jake perched at the top of the fence. He was pointing to his right. I looked to see that there was a small opening at the far end of the fence. I scrambled to my feet and ran for it. I practically dove through the small hole in the fence. Scraped myself up pretty good in the process, but I didn't care. As soon as I got to my feet, a hand shot through the opening and grabbed a hold of my foot, causing me to fall forward. I looked back to see a smiling mask in the fence opening. Jake quickly ran over and stomped on the smiling man's arm. We heard a muffled grunt, and the smiling man withdrew his hand back through the opening. We ran as fast as we could all the way back to my house. After we calmed down, we decided not to call the police, as that would have resulted in Jake going back home and possibly never being allowed back over, as well as me being grounded for a week. So being the narrow-minded dipshits we were, we decided to keep this to ourselves, but you can bet your ass that we never walked that trail after dark again. It's a good thing that we were both in pretty good shape at the time, or we may not have made it out of that situation. I live in the same neighborhood to this day, and even after all these years, I've never heard of anyone else encountering these masked men. I guess we were just lucky that night. When I was about 12, my great uncle John came from Ukraine to visit us in Canada. He had a lot of stories, but this was the one that stood out. In the late 1960s, John was traveling by train from his village to another to visit family. He had to change trains at one point, and was dropped off at what amounted to a platform in a hut in the middle of nowhere. There was no one else at the station, and other than a dirt road that led off into the surrounding woods, there was nothing there. He waited for some time, but no train came. It was winter, and it was getting colder and darker. And just about the time he started worrying about a place to stay and some food to eat, an old woman appeared. An old woman appeared out of the twilight. She asked if he was waiting for such and such train, and when he confirmed, she said it wouldn't be along until the following day. She asked if he needed a bed for the night and offered him a meal and a room at her house, which she said was about an hour's walk from the station. Lodging with locals was more or less the standard when traveling in this part of the USSR. 
and my great uncle John wasn't looking forward to a hungry night on a cold platform, so he graciously accepted her offer. He took a suitcase, and they set off together down the dark road into the forest. It was more than an hour away, more like two, and by the time they arrived at the woman's small two story house, John was tired and hungry. They went inside, and the woman lit up some oil lamps and warmed up some soup. This was the first time that John was able to see the woman clearly, and he was a bit startled to realize that the old woman was actually a man. Not wanting to pry, and too tired to care, John finished up his soup and asked where he would be sleeping. She led him up the stairs to a tiny room with a window that contained a single bed and nothing else. He thanked her, and they said goodnight, and she closed the door. The door was then locked, leaving John in the dark. Somewhat creeped out by this, John called out to her, but she didn't answer, and he heard nothing else. Figuring that he would deal with it in the morning, and that she'd probably done it by mistake, John set his suitcase down and laid on the bed, deciding to make the best of it and get some sleep. Before he could fall asleep, though, he felt the urge to piss and got out of bed, hoping to find a chamber pot or something he could pee in. He got onto his hands and knees and began to feel under the bed in the darkness, thinking that that's where the pot would be if there was one. Instead, he found a body. Nope, Great Uncle John said, and went right to the window to see if he could exit the room. It was nailed shut. He knew that if he remained in the room, he was a dead man. But if he broke the window and tried to get out that way, there was a good chance that the old woman, and who knows who else, would hear him and come into the room before he could escape. So he did the only thing he could do. He pulled the body from under the bed, heaved it onto the mattress, and covered it with the blanket. He then got under the bed and waited. Sure enough, about an hour later, he heard footsteps coming slowly up the stairs and then towards the room. The lock clicked, and the knob turned slowly. In the gloom, John saw someone moving towards the bed. He then heard several horrific and sickening thuds. The person had bashed the body on the bed with a large crowbar, which they then dropped onto the floor right in front of John. There was silence. Then the person left the room, and the door was shut again. The footsteps went down the stairs. John moved out from under the bed, took the crowbar, and was able to slowly pry the window open. He didn't say, but I imagine he was shitting bricks the entire time. When the window was up, he threw his suitcase out and then dove through himself, not caring what was below him, only worried about what was behind. He landed without too much injury and began to run into a field behind the house towards some lights in the far distance. It turned out to be the highway, with some military and transport trucks on it. John was able to hitch a ride to another village where he could catch a train. He didn't bother reporting what happened to the authorities, since at the time, in the USSR, there was a distinct chance that he would have been the one that got into trouble. He just thanked God that he managed to escape, and decided that the next time he traveled to visit relatives, he would take another way. I live in Florida, and this incident happened about three weeks after Hurricane Irma, so not that long ago. Back in July, the ex and I had just finalized the divorce, and I moved into a gated neighborhood, where every house was rented out by the same rental company. It's a very small neighborhood with about 15 houses tops. All 15 of the houses are around a man-made lake, with the backyards facing the lake. No one really has a fenced-in backyard. When you walk out your back door, you'll see the lake in front of you and your neighbor's yards on each side of you. Everyone in the neighborhood seemed very close. Someone was always having a family party or barbecue or having people over to watch sports. 
I was still depressed about my divorce at the time, so I never partook in these social gatherings. The only person I got to know was my next door neighbor, Steve. He was active in the Navy and had a huge love for guns. Steve is the true hero in this nightmare. My daughter, Alice, was four years old, and she would stay over every weekend. Alice's bedroom window faces the backyard towards the lake. I spoil that girl to death. She truly is my everything, and I count down the days to the weekend every week just to be with her. That's why I was upset when Irma came, and I had to go almost three weekends without seeing her. The weekend before the storm, she was with her mom. Then obviously the weekend of the storm, she was still with her mom. And on top of that, she had to stay with her mom the following weekend, because my power was still out. No AC in Florida is miserable. The humidity was so bad that week that I slept in my daughter's room the whole week because she had the only room with a window that faced the lake. I opened the window so the wind could cool the room as I slept. Eventually the power came back on and Alice starts visiting me again like normal. That was when the nightmare started. My daughter would complain about the singing lady and how she doesn't like her anymore. I thought maybe that she was referring to one of my ex's friends, or someone she knew from school. Maybe there was a teacher at her school that sang to the kids that she didn't like. That Saturday night, Alice woke up screaming bloody murder. I ran into her room and turned on the light and found her hiding under the covers. I asked her what was wrong, and all she could do was point to an empty corner of the room and say, Look! Look! But there was nothing there. She was acting as if she saw a ghost. After I calmed her down, she started to talk about the singing lady again. Please tell the singing lady to not come back. Please, Daddy, make her go away. Obviously, she was having nightmares. I showed her that there was nothing in the closet and nothing under her bed, and there wasn't anything to be afraid of. She calmed down and eventually went back to sleep, and I quickly went back to my room and got into bed. It couldn't have been no more than 20 minutes before Alice comes running into my room, screaming, She's back! She's back! Alice absolutely refused to go back into her room, so I let her sleep with me. The next morning, Sunday morning, I took Alice out to breakfast, and then we stopped at Target to pick up a baby monitor. I haven't used one since her mom and I were still married, but I wanted to easily be able to hear her if and when she started having these nightmares again, so I could respond quicker. After I set them up, I showed Alice how they worked, to give her assurance that I could hear her and she was safe. That night, she slept soundly and didn't make a peep all night. The following weekend, Alice had to stay with her mother again, because she caught a stomach virus from one of her friends at school. It was Saturday night, and I was still asleep in my bed. It was around 2 a.m. when I heard it. A woman's voice humming a soft nursery rhyme through the baby monitor. The humming got louder and clearer as the voice got closer to the monitor. I wasn't dreaming. I could hear a woman softly singing lullabies in my daughter's bedroom. I have never been so scared and dumbfounded in my life. Then the voice spoke out. Alice, sweetie, are you awake? Adrenaline shot through my veins and I jumped out of bed and locked my bedroom door. I picked up my cell phone and called Steve from next door. He didn't waste a second. As soon as I got off the phone with him, I heard him storm out of his back door screaming, Don't you fucking move! I ran outside and found him aiming his shotgun at a woman crouched outside my daughter's window, the one I had left open after Irma and never closed. Steve quickly dropped his guard when he recognized the woman. It was Jean, the neighborhood maintenance woman. Steve's wife came running out after him and confirmed that it was her. Jean played dumb, said that she was not singing, and didn't even know my daughter's name. 
She said that she was near my daughter's window because she was doing her weekly patrol, looking for gators. She thought she saw one and approached our house from the lake. Bull fucking shit. That bitch was singing. And she called out to my daughter by name. Yes, it's true that there may have been a few gator spottings around the neighborhood. And yes, a part of Jean's job was to patrol the lake at night every now and again. But at 2 a.m.? I obviously knew it was bullshit. And even though neither Steve or his wife called her out on it, I could tell from the look on their faces that they didn't believe her either. The next morning I went over to Steve's house to thank him and told him exactly what happened. He told me that Jean and her husband have been known to be a little cuckoo, but this is by far the craziest thing that has happened. Steve helped me install metal bars on Alice's window that afternoon.